Lab. This is definitely a 101 talk. It's to kind of give you an overview of what this uh, kind of thing is. It's a bit of a technology, a bit of a social thing. It's a lot. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to kind of cover the background of it, uh, introduce the Indie Web, and then talk about some of the tools around it. Um, so it's in, just as like kind of a broad definition, uh, the Indie Web is a people-focused alternative to the corporate web. It's an active community, a mindset, and a living collection of tools and technologies. So let me tell you a brief story about the internet and how kind of communication evolved on it. We used to have door games, BBSs, MUDs, email. Um, people would create content on whatever channel was provided to them. Then there was the World Wide Web. Uh, what you can't see is this is all blink tagged and like just wonderful, wonderful times. Um, we had this kind of birth of the thing called the web with web browsers, with ways to render HTML and that type of content. And then people started creating home pages pretty much immediately because now you can just send someone to your homepage. This quickly evolved into blogs, um, something that was self-hosted or third-party hosted, but somewhere where you would write things, make things, create things, and you would put it on so that everyone could find it. But it wasn't just like a snapshot of yourself. It was actually this updating content. However, we had the launch of Web 2.0. And Web 2.0, with that, one of the big kind of core ideas is social networking. Right, your social graph, this idea of being connected, uh, who your followers are, who you're following. Um, and with that, we kind of killed off self-publishing. I mean, there have been some projects that have tried and are still trying, but the idea that you published your own content on your own space somewhat went away. But people are still making things right. So where, why, how, like how is this not just like, oh, now it's all social, now it's not content. Well, people are making them in what we call walled gardens. That is not too uh, great on contrast. But the idea of a walled garden is a silo. You create content and you put it in the silo and the content stays in that silo. They can't talk to content in other silos. <coughs> so there are a lot of problems that kind of come out of this. Um, one, everything's centralized, right? Server goes down, it's gone. Generally, these silos are commercialized. I mean, servers do cost money to run. You know, of course, a lot of people enjoy it and have the hobby of running them. But for, you know, what is it like? four billion people or something like that, it, you're not gonna run that in your basement. I mean, if you are, I'd like an account and uh, <laughs> they're restrictive. You cannot post the content that you want to always. Facebook has um, automated bots and filters and things that take stuff down. Um, and they're exploitative. You, the, your content is being used to get other people's eyeballs, which is then sold as ads. And basically, these aren't good things. These aren't the, the values that we kind of support. But there's little incentive for interconnectivity, right? The silo doesn't need to talk somewhere else. Uh, your identity there is not your identity anywhere elsewhere. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of issues surrounding it. But we seem to find ourselves in these walled gardens, in these silos, repeatedly. Why? Well, they're easy, they're free, lowercase f. Um, it has read, write, you know, update, delete, all built in. You didn't have to deal with any of that. Um, generally, kind of a good UI. You know, there's someone spent lots and lots of money to make this thing. But is that really what we should be doing? 
So this is one of the founders of the IndieWeb project. And uh, his quote is, I don't care about federation. I care about my content and my friends. Right? So it takes it away from this idea that all I care about is that I can talk across all these sites. It's really the reason we're using these things is because we, we want to use them for us. So kind of the three guiding principles of the indie web. First one is your content is yours. It's not Facebook's content. It's not Twitter's content. When you post something on the web, it should be you. It shouldn't be a corporation posting it. Now, the thought of maybe you as a corporation could come in, but this is really talking about things at the personal, individual level. Too many companies go out of business losing all of their users' data. If that happens, that's clearly not your data. That's that company's data. By joining the indie web, your content is yours and stays yours. You're better connected. So this kind of stems from this idea of pushing to multiple services. And we'll get to this in the technical details. But if I want to post right now to Twitter and Mastodon and Facebook and my newsletter and you know a blog and something else, like this is not a use case that's that easy unless you go to each of these sites and then have to deal with their stuff and then what happens when like someone on Facebook sends a comment? How does the person on Twitter know or do they need to know or what happens if you have a redaction or an update? How do you deal with that? With the indie web, your articles, your status updates, they can go to all of the services, engaging with everyone. That includes the replies, the likes, all of that. And of course, you're in control. Not only in the sense that we talked about, about like whether or not the content gets deleted or not, but the format, how you display it on each site. It's your content, shouldn't you be the one saying what it is? You, shouldn't you be the one who sends, uh, like censors or doesn't censor? What if you don't want things permanent? Why can't you just take them down? I mean, these are these are kind of, as content creators and users and like us, the core freedoms that we might want to have or expect. Um, not to be monitored, not to have our data sold, things like that. Being able to have readable links I mean, wouldn't it be nice if you have, like, instead of some long string of characters, you just, like, go to slash links. That's, the, that's where I want my links. Um, so, yeah. From that, I was born in the indie web. And the indie web camp is this gathering of people. There are now multiple ones held around the world. But the first one was held in uh, Portland, eight years ago, six, eight years ago, somewhere in that range. And um, I'm just going to kind of go into the backstory of that briefly. So as, as many web projects have started, um, if we want a history lesson, we turn to the wiki. So I'm going to quote a few things from the wiki here. But the term indie web was coined in 2010. Um, by two people whose last names I'm going to try not to butcher, but Aaron Parecki and Tantec Selik. Yeah. Um, after attending the Federated Social Web Summit in Portland, Oregon, they were inspired to launch IndieWeb, which was focused on three ideas, or three ideals. Bringing together people that create, design, UX, code, uh, create, Design UX code. Yeah. Anyway, they they work on the web instead of just chatting. They actually create. They're creators. This concept that they termed self dog fooding, which is the idea that you use your own creations on your own website, primarily for yourself. <coughs> if you need a tool, that's you who needs the tool, and that's why you've developed it that way, and that means that you know what it does and how it does it, and you're more able to kind of interact with that tool. Um, so you care, right? And so that was one of those three ideals. And then finally, data ownership. This is that idea that you, you are the author, you own it, you get to decide how 
it's interacted with, what licensing it has, that type of thing. Now, the next year, uh, Aaron Tantec, Amber Case, and Crystal Baisley organized the first indie web camp. So, 2011, so we're at eight years. Uh, the project page was launched in 2014 by the W3C, Social Web Working Group. And in June of 2016, I attended, I'm kind of in that back left corner, actually with the same shirt, I believe, um, the first Indie Web Summit, which is what they renamed it as Indie Web Camps were starting to be held around the world. Um, it was my first time. It was held in Portland. It was two days. It was great. Uh, one day was presentations. One day was not quite an unconference. Like, there was the unconference atmosphere of working on stuff, but it was more, you're there to work on things. You're actually there working on your website. And, th like, it's much more hands-on, which is, you know, what this is all kind of about. Unfortunately, uh, my laptop broke on the way, and I had to ship it out of Portland, so I wasn't able to work on my web project as much. But I was able to work on the specification, work with some people, and actually get to hear like kind of the inner workings and gears grinding of the indie web, which was just really a great experience. So these are the principles. I believe it's 11 principles that um, are the current principles of the indie web. Owning your own data. Data is for humans first, machines second. You might have heard of that one sometimes with like markdown or things like that. Building things for yourself. Eating your own dog food the things you just built for yourself. Documenting, it's a good principle. <laughs> Open source, I mean, that's why we're here. Focusing on UI and design, or UX and design. Building platform agnostic. Build for the long web, long web being this idea that, you know, what happens in 200 years? What does your website look like? How is it even read? How is it stored? And then fo focusing on plurality, and of course, having Fun. So I'm going to move on to a couple of the kind of core protocols, technologies that make up the technology of the indie web. So the first one I'm going to talk about here is indie off. Indie off is a way to interact with OAuth for signing in, um, for authentication, that type of thing. It uses any OAuth provider as a um, <coughs> authentication mechanism that says my website is my login. So I guess I didn't really touch on that as much as, um, yeah, I don't think I touched on it as, as much as I probably should have, but one of the core things on how all of this works is that you own some space on the internet in today's meaning and for the last however many years that's a domain name. You own a domain name, that is you, everything links from that domain name, that is your identity online. So when you log in, you no longer log in with an email, you no longer log in with this or that. You say, here is my domain name, I am the owner of this, I own all of the content on this. So I'm going to log in with my domain name, then there's a mechanism that verifies that your domain name is you and verifies it's connected to an OAuth that has some sort of other mechanism built into it. And then that all comes together to let you just log in. Um, this has now been baked into WordPress, which is kind of neat. Like that's, you know, you don't really need extra plugins, you don't need to set up any services, it's just like install it, get it to work. Next one is microformats. <clears throat> So microformats are part of what might be called like the semantic web. Um, it's a way of organizing your HTML such that you can specify this is a photo. This is the name of the photo and the category of the photo and it had the properties. And you put that into your source so that it's machine readable but it's also human readable. If you're like a coder, you can just look at it and it's using names that are specified as being something that's kind of easy. Uh, it was 
built in such a way that it can easily be added to anything without having, um, it, it basically piggybacks on an old part of HTML, like but a basic technology, but that also allows you to interact with it in really cool ways because style sheets, um, you add it to classes. So you can have more than one, right? It's not, it doesn't have the ID issue there. Um, but as classes, you can say, I want to have select all of these names or all of these whatnots and make them display this way. And you actually can very, again, human, human readable to see this stuff. Um, there are bunches of these specified. For instance, people, organizations, events, locations, blog posts, products, reviews, resumes, recipes. There are kind of a bunch of specified ones and they're all pretty parsable, documented. Um, to say, yeah, I want to make a recipe. This is how it can be formatted, and thus anyone can read it because it's now like a standard readable thing. The biggest one is called the H card, or the H entry, is like kind of the top level. Um, and the H card is the one that's used to specify that you might think of it like a business card. Like an H card is, is something that you say, here's my picture, my name, my identity, here's my H card. Yeah, right, it's like a V card, but an H card. <laughs> so the next one's this idea of syndication. Now, syndication, I think, is probably the biggest thing that drew me to this like project and world. It's this idea, uh, as they've um, kind of acronymized it, is POSSE. Post on your own site syndicate elsewhere. This is the idea that you own your content because your content's first on your site before any, being anywhere else. So, you know, as much as we may not like certain copyright and patent and intellectual property type restrictions, they exist in our world to some extent. But if you put it up here and then elsewhere, there's no question that it's, it's your content. But the really cool thing about it is that when you put your content elsewhere, you put a little link that sends it back so people can click on it and it comes back to your main site. And that does uh, two things. One, there's a, a mechanism that people have developed so that if you update things on your uh, main, like main content page, it actually sends updates. So say you delete the post, it will go and delete the post on one of those other sites. Of course, not all silos support this, and that's, I mean, a problem you may not expect. But two, and this is really the the thing that gets me is you have a single source of truth. You've just said this is the real, like, this is the real post, this is the real article, the real whatnot. Um, there's a less strict version of the post on your own syndicate elsewhere, um, and that's, they call it pesos, which is publish elsewhere, syndicate on your own site. This would be the idea if you post on Twitter or Facebook or whatever you, you, you're posting, um, or if you, say, wanted to capture all of your old tweets or your whatnot, you just send them all to your site. So they still exist on your site as the form, but they're, yeah. So the next one is web mentions. Um, this is the, I, that idea I was talking about, about like what we might have uh, initially called pingbacks. Um, it's a protocol that's designed for how uh, over the internet these different indie web things like objects talk to each other. Um, but it's similar to a pingback. Um, sending notifications to indie web and those notifications can be, hey, I posted something new or hey, delete this article or anything like that. The really cool thing about most of these is most of them are W3C recommendations. These have like entered, these have been, a, it's a working group. A lot of the people are, are very involved and this stuff is just supported, right? Supported on browsers, supported on a lot of new things. And you just kind of expect it to be supported because it's a W3C recommendation. Now, how do we actually interact with some of this? How do we make this ours, right? I mean, kind of, we have the general idea of what it is, but how do we use it? So there's a lot of different apps and plugins and things that make this um, kind of
kind of useful. The kind of big CMS, as I mentioned earlier, is it's like baked in at a very, very core level to WordPress. So if you use WordPress, you're already mostly using any web. But there are a couple of like CMSs that are also uh, quite like built around the indie web. The two big ones uh, that I've played with and kind of enjoy, uh, one is Known, so like K-N-O-W-N, -N, and the other one is Ghost. They're both blogging platforms, but they kind of focus on indie web concepts from the get-go. For doing the this idea of posting elsewhere, like that could be, you can code it yourself, you could put it on your normal on your own site, but that's not the easiest thing for everything, and you know that's not something we all want to do. Um, so there's a service out there called Bridgie, that you just basically, it, it, very easy integration. You point your content, and it bridges it to Facebook and Twitter and whatnot and whatnot. It just it bridges it out. And uh, they have a new newer version of this called Bridgie Fed for all of your federated platforms. So your Mastodon, Diaspora, and whatnot. Um, this is a way to, to easily do the, the um, posse or posse or post on your own stuff. What about like publishing? How do you add all these little markdown elements, or not markdown, but um, how do you add the, the things that you're saying it's a recipe and all of this? And how do you get on your site? Right? How do you actually change, like, do you have to update the HTML of your blog post? Like, could, it can get a little tricky, a little overhead. So there's a um, couple of options. Uh, one is called Quill, and it allows you to publish in the different formats, so like one for Facebook, one for Twitter, whatnot, and it automatically will send it to your site and then send it to all of their ones, but it adds in a lot of that, that um, extra metadata. Um, another one is, is being able to do the web mentions. There's a thing called webmention.io that kind of handles some of your web mention stuff. Because this is, again, there's, there's technological overhead. I mean, it'd be great if we all have it working and do it exactly the way we want it on our own site and have done it. At the same time, that's too much to ask if, of everyone. Um, and then there's mobile. You know, what about mobile? Uh, so there's a cool thing, I, I haven't played with it yet, but an Android and iOS app called Indigenous, like I-N-D-I-G-E-N-O-U-S, which is like an app to, to interact with the indie web. Then there's the indie web reader, which is this concept that, it's like a, a you know, modern day RSS. It gets from all of your different streams, and it gets in the order that you specify, not whatever you know, social media X tells you you should read first. So there's, there's more. Uh, the IndieWeb Wiki has a lot of this stuff. That's at IndieWeb.org. And you can spend hours there. Um, but if we're baking this into our own website, if we're you know, going to really get to use this, we should have some sort of feedback whether or not our IndieWeb presence is supported, is working properly, right? So luckily, Brendan Novak and Barnaby Walters and others put together this thing called Indie Webify Me. It gives you different levels. It gives you very step-by-step. -step. If you want to be at this, you know, you have to do these things. So this was created at, um, in 2013 at Indie Web Camps in Brighton and in and Reykjavik. It's kind of a guide to getting started. Um, yeah, it's really cool. It's worth checking out even if you're like not gonna immediately implement it. A lot of people put in a lot of work to kind of figure out what those steps are. It does some automatic verification that you're reaching these steps. There's validators for the actual posts. So I talked about H cards. Um, seeing whether or not that recipe card actually is the recipe that you meant it to be, that things are, you know, I'm sure uh, if, if you've played with like Python, you've had like an extra space and everything's ruined. And yeah, this just basically um, 
says, here's what we're getting. Is this what you meant to send us? And so the three that uh, I've played with and that kind of have experience with, one is pin13.net slash mf2. One is webmention.rocks. And the other one is as2.rocks. .rocks seems like a great TLD. I have not used it beyond these, but yeah. And then there's where you could go with this. You know, how, how far, how advanced can we take it? Um, so there's this, like, I don't know what you'd call it. Um, so, okay, let me start from the bottom. There's this thing called the SWOT zero test. It's kind of like um, uh, the acid test, but it's the social web acid test. So it's, it's how, you know, what's your percentage of interacting and playing nice with the social web. Um, there's using it, the different APIs, actually interacting with them at the API level, whether that's activity pub, micro pub, micro pub, sub pub, something. The names get a little confusing after a while. Um, activity streams, being able to actually monitor and see as everything is moving around the indie web. I mean, that's, that can really get there. Um, and then there's this thing called indie mark, which is like a, you know, we had the indie webify me. This is kind of taking that a little further and saying like, I've reached this indie mark. I've implemented these things and these things and like going beyond just becoming part of the indie web. So this is my current website. Uh, there are kind of a couple things about it. Um, it's running Middleman, which is a static site generator, so I'm not running any listener or any whatnot, and I'm still able to interact with the indie web to some extent. I have indie off, which is handled through um, these profiles. So again, the single source of truth is kind of a big deal to me. I list all the profiles that, maybe not all of them, but I, I try to add them whenever I get the moment. All the profiles that are kind of publicly that I have on, and each one of these links to my own website, which redirects then to whatever profile. So like slash Facebook. So I go, if you go to you know, allsalt.net slash Facebook, it will then redirect you to my Facebook, which means if I ever want to get rid of Facebook or tell people what I'm doing now, you can still point people to that website but now I can change and say, no, I'm actually not going to Facebook anymore. I'm redirecting all Facebooks to whatnot. Um, the way Indie Auth works is you have to have one of these be an OAuth provider. So I OAuth through GitHub right now, but it could be anything. Um, but I just add a little thing on all of these that says, you know, this is me, rel me, check it. And in OAuth, or, uh, Indie Auth handles all of that stuff. This is the H card I was referring to. It has name, field, you know, work, whatnot, all that. Um, again, it's kind of yeah, kind of like a V V card. You can just download it and have your information. Um, I don't federate. So federation is this idea that your content uh, gets displayed on other people's sites, and you display their content. And it kind of makes that social web, social graph. Um, I don't federate because one of my core, like really interest in this whole project and in this whole thing is that everything on that site is my, all of the words, all the things, all the typos, all the whatnot, that stuff I put on there, everything. And I don't want other people's comments on my site for better or for worse. You know, makes it less interactive. Maybe someday I will have a separate like domain that I point to that like is like here's the stuff that if you want to see the conversation surrounding my post, go here. That being said, I don't actually post much um, as things are. But there's a lot of to do's, a lot of things I could do to get my indie web mark up. So yeah, to kind of recap. Um, I think we live in a pretty cool time. Projects like these can 
travel from inception to being supported by the W3C. This is a place where you're in the driver's seat. All the profiles originate from you. You, you retain all of that. And the free Libre open values are respected. I've been wanting something like this since, since the 90s, since I started. I, I've, I've always wanted it. Sure enough, I found someone who's been working on this. Not just someone, but a whole community. I'll bet that there are a few of you who feel that way too. So, while we didn't do it this year, um, last year, or so upcoming in uh, June is the Indie Web Summit. I recommend checking it out. Last year, f right before LinksFest, we held uh, one of these Indie Web Camps, Indie Web Camp Bellingham. We didn't uh, have the resources for this year, but we may be holding one at Siegel. And just check out that old profile, check out that old domain name, your, that website, dust it off. I'm sure you, like, you know, there's something you want to do with it. And really doing is a big part of what this is all about. My excitement comes from the idea of the single source of truth for a content for your identity. That's my excitement. I don't know where yours comes from though. Thank you. So we have some time for questions, feedback, comments, whatnot. So. Is there any thought of, or any mechanism for using um, cryptographic uh, uh, mechanisms for like H card authentication? So a big part of the you know, kind of point of the indie web is to be um, somewhat public especially like for things like H cards. I think like signatures. Yeah, signatures. I mean, I have links to my GPG and that type. I have not heard of anything quite like that. I know there is some amount of um, authentication in content and being able to see, you know, uh, just show things to a friend group, for instance. Um, by the way, as, as we keep talking about um, questions, I also want to mention that I have a conference coming up in Seattle. Uh, November 9th and 10th, and uh, that's Siegel, the Seattle GNU Linux Conference, very similar to this one, but a bit smaller, and our CFP opens June 4th, so I'll just leave that up for, but yeah, um, so yeah, as far as kind of security in areas, there's definitely been talk of like, how do you deal with your Facebook friends and posting something to your Facebook friends, but you don't want it to be public for everyone, how do you deal with that? And so there's some mechanisms, I don't think any are quite there, but, um, I hope that kind of combining with some of the um, some of the excitement around like Mastodon that and Matrix and things like this that we can get into it. Yeah, and Diaspora. I saw Diaspora at a conference table. I was like, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, is there a mechanism that verifies that what is posted on your site? Um, so, so let me see if I can uh, restate. So, is there a mechanism that checks in the silo that the content you said would go into the silo is actually the content that appeared there? Yeah, um, like for an example, you post on a social media platform and they, they take your image Sure. Right. You're, they're using your identity and your part of your content and modifying it to influence a group. Right. And I think this is a great platform where possibly this. So, 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 um, no, there is no way or tool that checks the siloed content. But the point of this is that, and I mean, this is one of those things where you want to tell people. Here's a link back to the original content. You really shouldn't be reading that here. You should be reading that on 
you know, on my side or on whatnot. Um, and so having the control on your site is really as far as you can go. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the big points of this is that otherwise the content is siloed and stuff like that is happening many times it's being changed, deleted, whatnot. But yeah, thanks, great question. So what if you want like some media content to be posted to only some site? Mm -hmm. so, you know, if you wanna, okay, I'm doing this post and I want this to go to everything, but I'm doing this post and I don't want it to go to this, to this site. Sure. Is there a way to? Oh, absolutely. Do um, so, <laughs> Uh, one, I mean, there are kind of two things here. One is that there's the specification, and if you're building your website, then you can handle that request however. One of my, like, back burner projects for my own site that I really want to do is that when I uh, update, I'll actually have a header item that says post to these social media sites and, like, somehow handles the formatting in the way I want. And I haven't quite figured out the details, but... In my world, for like my ideal static site, it would ha be handled at the time of compiling my site and then uploading it. It would send out based on my little list. However, if you're using one of these tools like Quill or something, you just you actually specify. You say I I only want it in this this and this. And so that's uh, same with like if you're on Known or Ghost. Like those are uh, they they make that very easy and clear. site generator like you did with the mm -hmm. Jack, Jacob Hugo or something instead of a real blog platform like Ghost mm -hmm. or WordPress, like what functionality do you need to be built into one? So uh, you can't really federate without a third party server, like, or if, without a server somewhere, right? You can put that server endpoint somewhere, but you can't uh, get people's pingbacks, right? Or people's comments. Um, you can still indie off. I mean, you can still add the mark down or mark up. Um, really, I'd say the, the big one is federation, and the other one, which is kind of, it just becomes a little bit more of a hassle to, to do the posse. So you can always manually posse. You can always say, here's my blog post, here's a short link to my blog post, or my whatever post, and then go on Facebook and copy all that and paste it. But doing that automatically with a static site generator is harder. Um, but this is what, like, this is what I was saying. My one of my big things that I want to um, include or get to is that when I compile, it automatically handles those things that are kind of manual right now. Yep. I was wondering the same thing. So Google did. Mm -hmm. It looks like in US has some articles on Hugo and Checkle. Oh yeah, for sure. Pretty promising. For sure. But no built in. Yeah, no, uh, the community, super active, their IRC channels, crazy, and it's one of these, you know, wikis get a little interesting because there are a lot of really smart people working on a lot of different topics, and um, you can find just, like, you can spend some time on the wiki. But I, I do recommend uh, this event, one of, one of the favorite conferences I've gone to just because of how focused on being hands-on, be, like doing gear, doing stuff. And, and I was saying, I'm hoping to organize an indie web camp in Seattle before single, um, so hopefully, before or after near Miranda. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. I know you're not hosting comments on your site, but do you know of anybody who was successful at using Bridgie to bring comments back in Facebook? Um, I definitely comments know people like doing that. comments, and I know they're doing it in the, like, comments from the indie web yeah. people. I don't know. Because it's really, it, it works really well for going off. Yeah, go, but it, it doesn't really work that well, at least from Facebook. From Facebook. So this is, a, works great. this is the thing with siloed content. Yeah. I feel it's like right. at one point Facebook did have a way to do it with their API, and then they locked it down, yeah. as I recall. Yeah, yours ago when I first started using it, the, the input from Facebook was working, and all of a sudden it just stopped. Yeah. Still. Yay silos, right? <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I mean, that's why people are working on this stuff is because of that. So yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you all.